And uh, let's see, my chat. Ah, it was Ainsley instead of Liz who told me to hit record. Okay. All right, recording. And um, welcome to day four of Quasi Virtual University Snow Hydrology. Um, we're going to start with a um, recap and logistics of what we've been doing. And as a photo to look at, um, here is a picture again from Alaska from Matthew Sturm of rhyme on a tree. Uh, our model doesn't do that. Okay. All right. So outline for today, we're going to start with class logistics, uh, looking at the schedule again, talking about the homework, and then just sharing the conceptual sketches and questions from your first writing assignment. Then we'll go into um, the snow surface interface. Um, we've been talking about how snow is a boundary layer problem, and therefore what we do at the boundary is really important. We're going to talk about both snow surface temperature and albedo. And then we'll end by talking about turbulence over snow, and in particular, yeah. parameterizations. OK, so where are we? We've gotten to October 15th. We are amazingly almost halfway through the class. Um, you could, should continue working on homework one, as well as start reading two. I'll be talking about reading two today. And I went ahead and on Canvas moved the due date on homework one. It was originally due on Wednesday the 17th. But just because all of the plotting and software is so new, feel free to turn it to Wednesday if you would like. But you have until Friday at midnight Eastern time to turn it in on Friday. <laughs> all right. Um, the reading two critique will be due a week from today. Again, similar to the other one, you just, I tell you which parts to focus on and think about and answer specific questions. I've also posted um, the final assignments for the reflection and the presentation on Canvas. Regarding homework one, thank you to everyone for posting questions and issues on discussion. Special thanks to everyone who answered other people's questions. We really appreciate that. Please keep it up. Um, as I mentioned before, you can wait till Friday to turn in the assignment. The critiques are partially graded. I got through about half of them. Um, the second reading assignment and questions are posted and due next Monday. Homework two is still in the debugging phase. We're aiming to post it this Wednesday, but it might be a day or two late. We want to make sure that we at least caught all the bugs we know about before we give it to you. Um, the reflection is due at the end of the course is basically just write one page of feedback on how to make this online course better. This is a work in progress. So you get five points as long as you give me some construction constructive feedback. The presentation assignment, the very last day of class, I am turning over control of the screen to you. Um, you can decide what you want to present on. Ideally, I don't want to give you more work or more things to do. Just while you're doing your homework assignments or running the model, something interesting you found that you want to share with the class. I would, due to the number of people enrolled in the class, everyone needs to get a partner or two, ideally form groups of three and talk for about eight minutes, allowing two minutes for questions. Um, we'll be working over the next week. Again, use the discussion group, email each other to find partners. Let me know by next Monday when you turn in your reading assignment, one, who your partners are. Again, the goal is not to add a lot of extra work, but rather to show something you found that was interesting to everybody else and maybe you felt like iterating something different in the model and you want to share some of your results. Are there any questions from anybody about logistics? Homework one, reading, anything? Feel free to unmute yourself and talk. Type in the chat box, preferred mode of online communication.
The difficulty of not seeing you is I can't see if everyone's just nodding their head there, okay. All right. So given a lack of any noise typing or otherwise, I'll presume everything's crystal clear or you will tell me later. Um, so what you're, all right, there's uh, still some issues with section D, but working through it. Um, it sounds like that one probably keep, keep posting in the discussion board on Canvas, um, anything that comes up and we'll keep anything specific, we'll keep offering hints. Um, okay, so for reading two is the PILPS model intercomparison experiment. And the paper was written by Drew Slater in 2001. It basically was looking at snow modeling schemes in 21 different land surface models. And um, all basically were able to make a snowpack. So here's a picture from the paper that you're going to read. And um, you can see that they all simulated a snowpack. It roughly started at the same time, but disappeared within plus or minus a month of the same time. Um, there's still a lot of spread in both the amount of snow simulated, even with the same forcing data and the timing of the melt out. A lot of the model divergence occurred during early or midwinter melt out. Some disappeared entirely in December, some didn't melt at all. Um, some models consistently melted earlier, such as the um, Seishiba model, and some consistently melted out very late, the SPS model. What we're gonna be talking about today in class are um, things that you know really came out in this paper when you read it about things that really explained these model differences. Again, this paper also brought about why we would want to have a model like SUMO where you can change just one thing at a time because it took a lot of detective work to try to figure out what it was with all these models that varied in so many ways that was actually controlling this difference in snow modeling. What we're gonna talk about today that came out as really important aspects highlighted in this paper were the albedo, the emissivity, and the aerodynamic formulas, formulations, which is really how the models handled turbulence. Um, the last time we already talked about, about thermal conductivity, and then when we talk about spatially distributing a snow model, we'll talk about fractional cover. All right, now, I thought it was absolutely fascinating to look at how everybody represented SUMA. I remember when Martin Clark was putting the model together, he had about 17 different drafts of what pictures he should put in to actually explain the model. And um, he was thrilled to have everyone in class help him. I, I posted a question, asked people if they wanted names, not names. Nobody replied. I'm guessing that meant nobody cared strongly or nobody saw it one or the other. If you want me to add your name and put it back up later, send me a note, I will do so. Um, right now, they're followed by people in the class with no names attached. Um, so attribution is people in our class. Um, so some people um, you know, drew box schematics of what's happening. Other people drew you know, more pictorial representations. Um, you know, some people didn't like anything happening underneath the surface of the snow. Um, People drew trees very differently. I like all the trees, different layers. Um, this one, it's a little hard to read, but it's it's a gorgeous uh, landscape going on here with lots of different kinds of trees and cool mountains. Um, really, the the vertical columnar nature of the whole model. Um, the equations of different numbers within the model, the layers. Here's a tree with a lot of interception on it with the equations, um, rather microscopic, that's all there. Okay. Um, here's how the um, code actually works with what components go in where in the code. Um, here's a um, more 3D column with uh, multiple columns in the subsurface, again, the equations and a giant tree. Um, fluxes and equations, um, more fluxes and equations, where today we're really gonna be talking about all these fluxes right at the surface of the snow. This one had a slope going down. Um, 
that's another one with the, the tree is now a big leaf canopy model and the vertical representation. Thank you everyone for great questions. Um, my goal is to get them all answered by the end of the course. Um, the canopy, we will be discussing canopy parameters within the model and within multiple models on Wednesday. One I can answer today is um, about choices in putting SUMA together. The question was if there were so many different methodologies that SUMA was trying to unite under a single modeling framework, how were the final sub-processes and resulting parameterizations chosen? Um, I know when Martin was doing this, he was trying to find the parameterizations that were most common across different commonly used hydrology and land surface model schemes. So he was working very strongly to unite all the people doing climate modeling and all the people doing watershed basin modeling. He was not trying to accommodate anybody doing avalanche modeling. And he included anything he could find that looked realistic. He excluded anything he thought was obviously wrong. If he couldn't prove it wrong, he put it in as long as it could work within the framework. There were some choices such as modeling liquid water percolation with a shockwave that he couldn't put in because it was numerically unstable and just wouldn't work within the code. The how SUMA works questions requires a fair bit of digging into the code itself, and I'm going to postpone these um, until I have more time to try to figure out exactly what the right answer is, because I don't want to say something that's not quite right. All right, while I change um, from logistics into the science, does anyone have any more um, questions? All right, so here is um, module 4.2, talking about the interface of our boundary layer problem, and specifically the surface interface, because it's much more dynamic. Most places, the snow-soil interface is pretty much a constant temperature all winter long, and is just included in the model as part of that temperature profile. So this is a photo, I believe, from Senator Beck Basin in Colorado. The photo was taken by Jeff Deems, and this is a dust on snow event, which is probably the most picturesque example of snow albedo not doing well. All right, so we talked about last week about the surface energy balance, and we talked about um, solar radiation and long wave radiation are our two largest forcing from the atmosphere. So our model, if we determine those incoming solar and long wave before we start running our snow model. But our modeled snow albedo is going to modulate our net solar radiation, how much our model absorbs versus is reflected. And our modeled snow surface temperature is going to modulate both our net long wave radiation by controlling how much um, long wave is emitted back to space and our near surface turbulent energy transfer. So quick quiz, type in the chat box. If we empirically model, so this is going back to last week, if we empirically model both incoming solar and long wave radiation with a range of popular methods. So last week we talked about how we often don't measure these. We have to, before we start running SUMA, come up with some way to do solar and long wave radiation. We're gonna keep our snow model parameters the same now, which of these is going to lead to a greater uncertainty in our model snow melt? Long wave or short wave? And one of these days I will make the polls work, but um, so far I haven't figured it out yet. So we're just gonna use the chat one. We are in uniform agreement on long wave. Everyone remembers Mark's paper from last week where I told you that long wave actually made a larger difference than short wave. And it's true. Here is the answer. Um, both matter a lot, uncertainty in long wave and short wave radiation. 
change snowmelt. This is a picture from Laura Hinkleman's paper in 2015, where the colors are different long wave sources and the line style variations are different short wave sources. So you can see, as everybody typed in the chat box, that the greatest variability in melt timing is due to uncertainty in long wave. We actually struggle more with our parameterizations of incoming long wave radiation from the atmosphere than we do with our parameterizations of incoming short wave. Okay, now let's make it a little bit more complicated. We talked about net solar radiation, which also depends on our modeled albedo, and net long wave radiation, which also depends on our modeled snow surface temperature. So if we add in uncertainty within our snow model in both our albedo and our snow surface temperature and emissivity, does net short wave or net long wave? So this includes short wave with incoming plus albedo and long wave with incoming plus outgoing have a greater influence on our uncertainty in snow melt timing. Everybody's changing their answer. We're going for net short wave now. Is anybody still going to vote for long wave or are we all net short wave? What if we're in the Arctic? Tricky. The answer actually to this one is I don't think anyone has conclusively shown. I think that most people currently would agree with what you guys say that net shortwave is very uncertain because we're really bad at modeling albedo. However, um, as you're experimenting with your um, different layers, and if you want to change the conductivity parameterizations, you may in the course of this class come up with an answer to this question that varies. I also think it actually varies depending on where you are. Um, but um, I have no evidence that anyone's wrong. So it looks like if we're just going popular vote, it's going to be net short wave of radiation right now. All right, so here, um, again, this is work by Nicoletta Christia, and I showed you before that when she changed um, the skin depth in a two-layer model, she changed the snowmelt timing by about a month. So just changing one of the parameters within the model had as great an uncertainty as all of those uncertainty in the incoming long wave. Now, she also compared how these um, how these modeled surface temperature changed. And so these changes in the model surface temperature are going to change how much radiation the model um, has leaving uh, in, in terms of outgoing long wave radiation, as well as have impacts on the turbulent fluxes, as well as have impacts into the bulk snow depth. So question, um, since she has, um, Okay, so she's she's running this model, and um, the lighter blue is the thinner surface layer. The darker blue is the thicker surface layer. The um, the dots in the red line are an observation of surface temperature at the location um, near where she's modeling. And the question is, um, in terms of the pack temperature, do you think that a thinner surface layer will give you a warmer or cooler bulk snow depth temperature. So thinner. So it looks like most people think thinner will be warmer. We've got one vote for cooler. Also, what happened in this model may not be exactly the same that happened in SUMA. It's a different location um, and has different numerics, so it's hard to isolate. But the, um, the thicker skin temperature was colder snow and the thinner snow temperature was warmer snow. So those who said warmer 
had it for this location and this model simulation. Um, because there's only one bulk snow depth temperature, it actually, we had um, one person wrote more variation. The model didn't have much variation at all. It's maybe a tiny bit for the thinnest snow temperature, but also a tiny bit in all of them. Um, some observations over these three days, um, there were diurnal fluctuations at 25 centimeters um, and nothing deeper, but the snowpack in bulk was observed warmer than any of the simulations where the thinnest surface temperature here ended up being warmest. All right, so how did that, it may have, what, that may have been due to outgoing long wave, may also been due to internal conductivity. And you can look at that as part of your first assignment if you're interested. Okay, so our, our outgoing long wave is gonna depend on our modeled snow surface temperature and our emissivity. So we've been talking about model decisions that impact our snow surface temperature. We've been doing homework related to this. Just type a few of these in the chat box. What are some things that, so here's our long wave out. This is for all long waves, a function of the emissivity times the Stefan-Boltzmann constant times the surface temperature to the fourth power. So what, what kind of things are controlling our modeled surface temperature? So how we model albedo will change our surface temperature. Mm -hmm. How we model shading, so our incoming energy to the surface. The density of the tree canopy is going to change this. Our layering, densification schemes, what we have forcing in the first time. Our incoming latent heat fluxes will probably have the largest impact on our surface temperature. Wind will affect our surface temperature, which will evolve with our turbulent schemes. Any other ideas? Hey. Hello? Was that me? I'm talking to myself. <laughs> okay, feedback to myself. Okay. All right. And the thermal conductivity and snow microstructure would affect this. Yeah, so it's it's a lot to unravel and it's it's not been well teased out of exactly how much each one of these processes has an impact. The other thing, as I pointed out from a summary of Drew Slider's paper, um, is that model representations of emissivity also make a difference. So what you see here on the right is a graphic from a paper by Dozier and Warren, 1982. This paper, as well as other ones I cite, they're not required reading, but they are included in the Canvas website on references if you want to download them and save them for any future point in time or look at them and what they say. Um, and what Dozier and Warren um, did theoretical modeling of the emissivity at the surface of the snowpack. And they found that it varies both as a function of grain size and as a function of wavelength that you're looking at. Uh, so what you have here is on the y-axis is emissivity, on the x-axis is wavelength that they were viewing at. Um, in the graphic on the right, all of these things that say lambda V is the viewing angle. So viewing angle of zero is looking straight down. Viewing angle of 75 is looking at quite a glancing angle at the snowpack. And then the one on the left is showing um, emissivity across wavelengths for different grain sizes of radiuses. Um, both the wavelength and the viewing angle have really large effects and this is really important for interpreting observations when we go into how you evaluate your snow model we'll talk about this a little bit more if you get into it in any depth so you really need to take a remote sensing class it's a different kind of model than what we're doing here for most purposes um as reported in dozier and warren 1982 and agreed on in most other sources i could find the all wave emissivity again the wavelength specific emissivity you need to use the Planck equation but for our model across all wavelengths if you just want to know what is lost from your model to space you can use the all wave approximation which is the Stefan-Boltzmann equation and the all wave emissivity 
is approximately 0.985 to 0 0.990. So it's pretty high. Um, you can see it's up near the top that you run into you know, problems when you have specific wavelengths or if you're looking at it in a different direction from straight down. These differences in emissivity result in you know, roughly a half a degree or less difference in the surface temperature. However, aggregated over time, if your model, if one model puts emissivity as 0.98 for all the time, the other one puts 0.99 and another one puts one because it just didn't want to bother dealing with emissivity, um, you can accumulate bias over time because you will be consistently losing more or less long wave to the atmosphere over the entire snowmelt season. Even though it's very small in any given day, it adds up as a bias. All right, so moving on to albedo. Um, and the albedo slides were borrowed from Jeff Dozier, who's spent his life looking at this. Um, we also have some meta slides, which reference slides that Jeff Dozier got from someone else that I got from Jeff Dozier. So they're double reference. All right, so albedo is, as you probably all know, reflected solar radiation divided by incoming solar radiation. Um, the nuances to think about in terms of how we're modeling albedo is that incoming solar radiation can be both direct and diffuse. And you will notice there's a difference between snow models is that some parameterize albedo separately for direct albedo versus diffuse albedo. SUMA does not, it lumps them together, but particularly if you're thinking about complex terrain with shading direct versus diffuse, and if the albedo is different, may become important. Um, albedo generally increases when the sun is closer to the horizon, when the solar zenith angle is greater. So albedo is also directionally dependent on the sun. Um, and when we say reflected, it means reflected at all angles. It's not just beam reflected, but it's anything that's reflected off the snow that's not going to contribute to melt. Albedo looks small, right? It's always between zero and one, but we care because a small change in albedo causes a bigger relative change in one minus albedo. So if you start with an albedo of 0 0.8 and you lower it by 20%, you get 0.64. So your fraction absorbed before you're absorbing 20% of the sunlight, you lower albedo by 20%. Now you are um, absorbing 0.36%. And so you actually increase the amount you're absorbing by 80%. Does that make, make sense? So you actually, um, even though albedo doesn't look like it changed much, the amount you're absorbing fractionally can be quite a bit as a greater fraction of the total sunlight you're multiplying by. To think about what causes snow albedo to change, um, just like we mentioned that, you know, again, in our model framework we're using here, the um, we are lumping the emissivity across all wavelengths. We're also lumping the albedo across all wavelengths. But it's important to recognize that albedo is also a function of wavelength. It is a spectral albedo. And so the spectral albedo can be thought of as the albedo at a given wavelength of light is the ratio of the reflected divided by the incoming solar radiation, specifically at that wavelength. Um, this is important for how we observe albedo and how we try to compare what our model is doing with our observations, which we'll get to again later in the class. Um, the reason we need to think about it this way is because snow is made up of ice crystals and ice has very different properties at different wavelengths. Again, I'm touching on this very briefly here, but if you get into a remote sensing class, you'll hear this a lot more. And impurities like dust or soot affect albedo differently at different wavelengths. So if we think about our incoming solar radiation or radiance, here is um, the red line is the extraterrestrial solar irradiance. This was coming at the top of the atmosphere. Um, you can see where the atmosphere 
absorb some of that, primarily the water vapor absorption of certain wavelengths. Um, you can see the visible light is you know, where we have the most irradiance, but there's actually still a lot of energy in wavelengths we can't really see. Um, and so it's important when you are measuring this to think about all of it. Um, so the, the albedo, the spectral albedo, is a fundamental property of the material. Again, we talked a little bit at the beginning about thinking from snow from a material science standpoint. It's going to vary with wavelength, with illumination angle, and with physical properties. What our model is representing is the broadband albedo. So it's a convolution of the spectral albedo and the spectral distribution of the incoming radiation. So it's the integral over all wavelengths of how much is reflected over how much came in for all parts of the solar spectrum. We're not explicitly modeling any of this in our model, but it's important to realize that that is what we're trying to get at, particularly as we go into trying to evaluate some of our model parameters. Okay, so here is um, a slide of how the albedo of clean snow varies with the grain size. So here's wavelength on the x-axis in micrometers and snow albedo in the y-axis and with the finest grain size in the blue and the coarsest grain size in the black. And here are just a picture of newly fallen snow at 0 0.1 millimeters versus some melt freeze grains at one millimeter. All right, so knowing about this spectral measurements people have made, we're thinking about what kind of parameterization we could put in our hydrology model. What happens to our snow grains, their size and shape, and hence their albedo with time after a new snowfall. So what might we want to model with albedo with time? What's going on? Type something in the chat box. Or if you feel adventurous, you could turn on your microphone and just talk to us. No one wants to be on the recording. You all know that the chat boxes aren't on the recording. Yeah, so every, everybody's got the point exactly. The, um, the snow grains are gonna get rounder, they're gonna grow in size, they're gonna get coarser, they're gonna cluster and compact towards larger grains. And all of this is going to reduce the albedo with time. So here is just my picture. As our grains get larger, we move from the blue to the black line here and the albedo goes down. It's, it's interesting to note from this picture that some of the you know, greatest change is actually in the near infrared wavelengths, just slightly longer wavelengths than what we can see. And um, this is, in reality, the, you know, the physics that we're trying to include in our, um, we're trying to include in our snow model. When we say there's a new snowfall, the albedo goes up, it's bright, shiny, right? Like bright, shiny white snow, and then the grains are going to evolve. Nothing else, if even if nothing else happens, and our albedo would just go down in time with age after each snowfall event. Now, the other thing, in addition to the grains changing, is the longer the snow sits out there, the more likely it is to get something on it. Um, this is a slide from Mackenzie Skiles that was borrowed by Jeff Dozier and then borrowed by me. And um, this is a dust layer that you can see in a very thin wedge of snow here. Here's dust in southern Colorado, and here's some algae on the snow surface. So um, most of the models that um, are run for hydrology or land surface models take into account the surface gradually getting dirty with time. It generally does not take into account algae. I don't know of any snow model that actually grows algae on the surface or a um, layer in the snowpack. So you see this, um, this brown layer in the picture on the right. And there's these dust storms that happen over a lot of Southern Colorado in the middle of the winter and it snows again on top of them. And you have to have a a layer resolving model that can keep track of their impurities here and they will appear at this point in time when the snow is melting down. 
Um, and those impurities actually can have a, um, a very large effect, as you can see, just by looking at the visible wavelengths, um, both red algae and you know dirty um, dust and soot on snow can greatly change the albedo, much more so than just the grains um, becoming larger with time. So you can see this in the paper we read by Martin Clark that um, you already read the text on the left here. It's just put in the slide to remind you that that really the model includes two different choices of fairly empirical parameterizations to describe the temporal decay in snow albedo after snowfall events. Um, one allows variable albedo decay and one allows constant albedo decay, but both are basically resetting the snow to some bright albedo after a snowfall event and then having it get um, darker with time. You can set the rate at which it gets darker and the um, albedo to which it asymptotes. Um, you can see that for Reynolds Mountain East, which is what you are modeling for your homework assignment, that the two of these did not make a big difference and both seemed to represent the observed snow depth fairly well. However, Senator Beck is the location where I was showing you all those pictures of the dust on snow, and that's where that picture with the layer partway down the snow was. Um, the, the model just wasn't able to represent that strong of a um, albedo forcing in its current setup. And you can see that um, the observed snow melts much faster due to that albedo than the modeled snow. And that both the choices in SUMA don't help you any. You need a different choice that doesn't exist there right now. And so here um, is homework 1E is not required. But if you are um, interested in it, you have this setup and some directions. So you are welcome to explore it for your final presentation. If you're feeling overwhelmed, you are also welcome to skip it. Um, it basically, you know, the, the state equation for snow albedo is a change in albedo with time, is basically a refresh with, with new snow minus a just decay factor, um, again, with a parameter of what's the minimum that you're going to asymptote to, how fast are you going to decay? And the two options are you decay at the same rate all the time, and the other one is that you, you vary how you decay at, at different times. Um, and you can just oscillate between the two of them, or you can both oscillate between the two of them and change the rates. The parameters, one thing just to be aware of with, with all of these is that even though these parameters have the same variable and the same name, when you change parameterizations or you change the setup of the equation, you should also change the baseline parameter that goes with it. The, the choice of the best fit number that goes into this decay rate is different between the two. And so you want to think about both changing parameters and parameterizations together. Um, there have been some problems, sort of like a unit conversion. If you accidentally grab a parameter meant for one equation and stick it in the other, easy to do when they have the same units. Um, you could also, if you're curious, you could combine the albedo exercise with the layering exercise and ask if albedo matters more for a certain layer structure, if you're interested. All right, any questions from anybody about um, snow surface temperature and albedo before we jump into turbulence? Jumping into turbulence sounds like we're going in a giant stream. A long time to take a question. Turn on your. Um, There's something in the one that changes on either rates. Is that change based on whether it's melting slash cold or medium? Yeah, so Justin had a question about when you change your albedo rates, what are things that would change your decay constant? The most common one you'll see is um, the melt cycle versus the non melt cycle. So you typically will see 
a change in the rate of decay after the snow has hit some kind of threshold that turns on for melt. Um, sometimes it will also be hard-coded hard -coded into models as like time of year. And you know, on March 1st, suddenly the albedo gets darker faster. Um, a, a lot of these are, are very empirical in nature and hard to justify which one is the best. Any other questions? I think, I don't know how easy it is for you guys to turn your microphones on or off. Pretty easy. You just don't want to. I can understand it's like talking to a boy. All right. So, um, all right. So, part three, since I'm the one who's paid to talk to a boy, I'll keep going. Um, module 4.3, we're now going to talk about turbulence over snow. For this one, um, I really want to give special thanks to Carl Lapo. Um, here's a picture of him graduating. I borrowed the slides from his 2017 PhD defense because I think he presented what's happening in turbulence over snow better than anyone else I'd seen, and I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. I also wanted to give a um, shout out that we are not doing any homework in this class related to turbulence, but if any of you in your future lives are trying to figure out the turbulence in your snow model, Carl has made all of his turbulence code that he developed from his PhD available on GitHub in Python as part of the TurbPy package. Um, there's a link here. Um, if you if you just Google GitHub Carl Lapo, you'll find it. Um, he also, in his GitHub repository, um, remember last time we talked about problems with leaving your shortwave sensors unattended in the woods and they tended to get snow all over them and have other problems. He has Python code for um, finding problems in your shortwave sensors as well. Okay, so you, um, when you read Drew Slater's paper, you're going to read that turbulence is one of the largest problems in land surface models and has been since 2001. Um, in the paper you read from Martin Clark on SUMA, you may or may not have even noticed that in table one, there is a spot that says stability corrections, various formulations based on the bulk Richardson number with three references. Probably went right over it, despite it being major problem. All right, so um, again, here these are Carl slides from, is from chapter two of his PhD thesis. And you can get a copy of his PhD thesis right now. And he has a paper based on it under review, which if it comes out, I'll post it. All right. So, um, so the, the first thing Carl thought about was that, you know, part of the reason we were having trouble figuring out how to get these turbulent fluxes is that we were informing all our model decisions based on snow water equivalent observations. And, um, you know, what, how does a change in snow water equivalent really mean to the energy balance? So if the change of snow water equivalent is less than zero, that means the snow is melting. It knows we have an isothermal snowpack and we have more energy going into the snow than is returned to the atmosphere. If the snow water equivalent is greater than zero, we know we're accumulating snow. We know we're accumulating frozen precipitation. We're not really sure about the bulk snow temperature. It may be less than zero. And if there's no change in the snow water equivalent, the bulk temperature of the snow may be less than zero. So Carl got really interested in, okay, if we just look at those times when snow is not changing and focus on the temperature of the snowpack, what can we learn? Um, so you know, when we are only evaluating our model by SWE, melt is the only period that we can directly know something about the surface energy balance. Um, and we actually are, you know, the times when there actually is melt is only a small fraction, that generally 83% of, of the time we're making observations that don't actually directly inform energy balance and melt processes. Um, this one I, I showed you before, but you can see that for most of these, you know, when you look at the snow water equivalent, you really only see the impact of putting airs during this very short season when the snow is melting. Whereas if you look at the snow surface temperature, you can see these airs are happening all of the time 
over the season. So um, there are you know, a lot of periods, a lot of days with no melt and surface temperature is varying widely. Um, and so he really wanted to look at um, energy fluxes, not worrying about modeling snow water equivalent, but instead focusing on um, what was happening relative to the surface temperature in the snowpack. Um, and so he used observed surface temperature. So rather than having your modeled surface temperature incorporate a lot of errors to the other things we just talked about, um, he's going to take an observation of snow surface temperature and then look at how well we can model heat flux above that surface temperature. So how, how on earth do we think about heat flux? So we're going to start with the parameter we know the surface temperature. And um, we want to know like, what exactly is turbulence. So probably most of you at some point in a cool physics or fluid mechanics class you took saw something about how flow evolves from laminar to turbulent flow, where you actually get a lot more mixing due to random motions in a fluid. In the cases of our snow, we typically have our wind over the snow surface, and then our turbulence is really mixing the air above that snow surface. So first, let's think about these turbulent eddies and what's called the buoyant generation of turbulence. So um, when we think about turbulence, again, we're thinking about mixing things in distance above the surface. We're typically thinking about profiles of the atmosphere above the snow surface. So what's drawn on the left here is um, height in Z above the surface, and then just a conceptual diagram of the relative values of two parameters from the surface. So we know um, due to boundary conditions, the no-slip condition is that wind immediately at the surface has to be zero, and then it generally increases above the surface to some value at the height at which it's measured. And the case drawn, you know, temperature is warmest at the surface and temperature decreases. So these are called unstable conditions because um, warm air rises, and so warm air wants to go up. So our atmosphere here is colder than our land or our snow, and we're going to have these turbulent eddies that bring warm air next to the surface up in the atmosphere and cold air up in the atmosphere down next to the surface. So these motions have the eddies will tend to cool the surface with this profile. And this is our um, you know, warm air moving up, and it's you know, positively buoyant. It wants to happen. So during unstable conditions, eddies move warmer air up into the colder air. And we know that this is rare over snow, since snow is almost always cooler than the atmosphere above it. Not always, um, but often. All right, so during stable conditions, so now I've got temperature going the other way. So now here's a case of warmer air going over colder snow. Um, we're going to tend to bring this warm air down and warm the surface. Um, now, warm air is lighter than cold air, so this is against buoyancy. So buoyancy is going to resist these vertical motions in this direction. So when we're thinking about how we model this, we know that the, the first case, unstable conditions, the turbulence wants to happen, right? Buoyancy is going to help with the turbulence. And in the second case, the stable conditions, buoyancy is gonna act against the turbulence. It, it isn't going to want to happen. So buoyancy is going to resist these vertical motions. So what that little table um, in Martin Clark's paper said about the Richardson number. The Richardson number, is a way to measure and parameterize the stability. So the Richardson number is a ratio um, that is the buoyant consumption of turbulence. So what is the, the likeliness that buoyancy will resist motion um, divided by the mechanical generation of turbulence? Just how windy is it? How much is it likely just to get going for turbulence? Now, in the paper you're going to read by Drew Slater, 
there was a problem in the majority of land surface models that basically said, um, you know, that you know, once once you have really warm air over cold snow, buoyancy is really going to resist vertical motions. So the surface temperature, there's radiative cooling. That's that long wave radiation we talked about going up into the atmosphere. The surface cools. As the surface cools at night, and particularly in the Arctic winter, where it's a very, very long night, you get really high stability. This then reduces turbulence. There's no chance, uh, if you shut down turbulence, there's no chance of this warmer air to warm the colder surface shuts down turbulence, and then you get further radiative cooling, the surface cools, and you get this cycle where the land surface completely decouples from the atmosphere in terms of turbulent mixing and end up with a very, very cold surface temperature to your snow pack. Um, so here's just walking through in words what I just said. Radiative cooling is going to occur at night, polar winter, or over very reflective surfaces such as snow. Um, here's a picture of the fraction of time snow cover is present over the globe. You can see the Arctic has a major problem in a lot of land surface climate simulations because of this feedback of we're not getting snow turbulence right. Um, stable conditions, if you have warmer air over colder snow, you'll get a small net gain of energy to the snow if it's windy. Arctic tends to be pretty windy. But if they're very stable conditions with much warmer air over much warmer snow, then the buoyancy factor is going to really reduce that energy transfer. And here is where models do something really different depending on the turbulent stability parameterization. The models either decouple and turn off the turbulence whatsoever. That's what happens in the stability feedback where the model keeps getting colder and colder or they continue turbulent exchange despite the buoyancy. And, and this is a decision that um, is very hard to measure and is um, seldom discussed in papers about models, but you can see really different feedback. And when you read Drew Slater's paper, you'll see how it has impacted um, land surface models globally. So here is a picture again from the paper you're going to read for the 21 models. And there, there's a large range in the simulated sensible heat flux in all these model inner comparisons. This is important not only from a when will the snow melt point of view, but also you know, what does snow do to the atmosphere point of view if you're trying to actually model feedbacks to the climate system from changing snow cover over the Arctic. This becomes a very important thing to consider. Um, these parameterizations led to a really large range in simulated surface temperatures. Um, so this was the range across all the models in Drew Slater's paper, and it's on the order of about 10 C of what they model the temperature being in the middle of winter. This has been um, written about even more recently in a paper by Holslag et al., again, where there's roughly a 10 C difference in the simulated nighttime temperatures near the surface of the atmospheric models and these problems with mixing near the surface have also caused large errors in simulated two meter air temperature over snow in most atmospheric models. So what Carl wanted to answer was, um, you know, how well do turbulent schemes, if we don't worry about how we model that surface temperature, if we just take an observed surface temperature, how well do the different schemes that we could choose in our model perform during stable conditions? And why? Why might these stability schemes be different? So how is turbulence actually parameterized? Um, and we're going to focus here on sensible heat flux. The, um, the latent heat flux is basically the same, except instead of a gradient of um, Instead of a gradient of the surface temperature minus the air temperature, you're looking at a gradient of the surface vapor pressure minus the measured vapor pressure in the air. Generally, the model decisions about the stability parameterization and the conductance 
are assumed to be the same across the um, modeling of sensible heat flux, which is just the temperature, and the latent heat flux, which is the vapor flux. The vapor flux is significantly harder to measure. So if you want to constrain model parameterizations with observations, the sensible heat flux is easier to do. If you're concerned about sublimation in your model, the sublimation is directly related to the latent heat flux because that's the transfer of water vapor from the surface of the snow up. So the first thing to consider with turbulence when you read about it is that it is in between the two worlds of atmospheric modeling and land surface modeling. It's very important to both, but it's treated very differently by the two communities. So the first thing you always wanna check is, what does this community describe as up? So as Carl has written it, a positive flux is heating the surface and a negative flux is cooling the surface. So he's got um, the negative right here. Um, and the sensible heat flux is going to be some constants times conductance terms times the wind speed times the gradient of how different is the surface temperature and the air temperature. The conductance term is the one that most is responsible for most of the variations between land models. So. Um, it's hard in a regular model to understand whether you have an error in how you parameterize your conductance or you have an error in your state variables, surface and air temperature, when you know you have an error in your sensible heat flux. So we're going to directly measure the state variables to just parameterize, look at the air in the conductance. So in this case, the air in the heat flux will be caused by air in the conductance. So here we get back to um, when, when you looked in that choice in the SUMA model, it said you could have an Anderson scheme, a Lewis scheme, or a Mart scheme. Um, another common scheme is the Mononobokov scheme, which is showed here. And Carl recently updated his high SUMA pack, his uh, curb pie package to include several more than what I'm showing here. But what you can see is that what these big differences are is really how the conductance varies as a function of this Richardson number. Again, how much heat transfer is allowed to take place as the model becomes progressively more stable. Higher Richardson number means it's more stable, it's less likely to mix. So the first three are bulk aerodynamic methods. They're computationally simple, and they were made to be put in climate models and land surface schemes. Um, the Anderson model is um, popular among hydrologists. It's used in a lot of hydrology models. And you can see with the blue line here that it completely decouples from the atmosphere. It has a rule that as soon as the Richardson number gets above 0 0.2, it's stable conditions and you no longer have any mixing. Um, the Lewis um, parameterization was an attempt to match the Mononobokov method. Um, if you go into turbulence theory, Mononobokov were the original um, scientists to come up with the idea of this parameterization for the flux. They were studying fluxes over agricultural fields in Kansas and came up with an iterative method to come up with what the um, turbulent transfer should be. So the Lewis scheme was a simpler way because iterative methods take a long time in modeling to try to match that. The MART um, parameterization was trying to better represent variability in the atmospheric stability, where they said that, you know, you might have a really stable patch over snow here, but it's less stable over trees there and it's all gonna get mixed together. So we think more mixing should be able to occur even if you measure a pretty high Richardson number. Um, the Mononobokov methodology is much more popular in atmospheric models. So if you look at the three of these and um, what they would parameterize the sensible heat flux being, 
um, you can see that um, for, for a held constant wind speed, you could see that the MART method, which doesn't decouple, would have quite a bit more heating as you get more stability, right? Because you have a bigger difference between the air temperature and the surface temperature. The Anderson method would completely shut off and not allow any to occur. And the um, Mona Nobukov and Lewis scheme, again, remember Lewis is trying to match Mona Nobukov, would come up with something in between. Now, in reality, um, what has been happening in a lot of models, now the SUMA model does not have the Mona Nobukov choice, but in a lot of um, atmospheric land surface schemes, um, in order to take care of instabilities in the turbulence flux, a lot of these schemes actually capped the stability correction. What on earth does that mean? They basically said that we are going to decrease conductance up to a point at 0.1 Richardson number, and then we're just gonna leave it constant from there on out. So even though it says in the papers describing it that they're using a Mona Nobukov scheme, it basically stops in stable conditions being a Mona Nobukov scheme, and instead just becomes a linear function of the temperature gradient and the wind. So basically it's a constant number, and as the temperature gradient goes up, your sensible heat flux just goes up with the line. Any questions so far? I'm talking an awful lot. Okay. All right. So let's let's think about this because it's it's pretty complicated. All right. So what we've drawn here is okay. We've got wind increasing above the surface, and theta here is potential temperature. Um, for purposes. It, it matters if you're going higher up in the atmosphere that use potential temperature. For purposes of most of what we do, it's a pretty minor correction. But if you start publishing atmospheric science literature, make sure it's potential temperature instead of the, it basically accounts for pressure variations instead of the observed temperature. Okay, so you got a wind speed, you've got temperature. And here, temperature, potential temperature does not change with height. So this is a neutral atmosphere the richardson number is zero and um the turbulent eddy there's no flux right because there's just no difference you can blow all you want there's no difference between the surface and the land okay so now we start getting a little bit stable right so now um, our potential temperature increases with height our warm air is going to mix down to the surface now our conductance is going to start going down, right? Because buoyancy is going to resist this warm air mixing down the surface. Now, when you get to very stable, Richardson greater than 0 0.2, is when the models all start disagreeing. This is when you still have this decreasing conductance, but how much should you decrease it? And in this case, the atmosphere and the land surface may decouple. So let's look at this at a couple sites with a lot of instrumentation. So right here is a weather tower near Snoqualmie Pass, Washington. Um, here's a view from Google Earth. It's right next to the ski resort at Snoqualmie Pass, if you've ever been there. And here's a sonic anemometer, which measures turbulent flux by sending three-dimensional, very high-speed pings of sound and seeing um, how they are delayed as a function of um, high-speed atmospheric fluctuations and temperature fluctuations within. The second site is in northern Colorado. In the shallow cold pool site, it was run an experiment by Larry Mart and was instrumented by NCAR's Earth Observing Systems. And so they went out and you can see the first one was my research group. We could afford one sonic anemometer at $50,000. But if you go to NCAR, they have a lot of them. Um, and they are all tagged. So you, you will, if you sell them on eBay, it's a really bad idea. OK, so um, so they put out all of these. Everywhere there's a little thumbtack, there's an array of sonic anemometers. And right here in the middle, what we're looking at are um, a tall tower with one meter observations of the flux and then 10 meter observations of the flux. And we're looking at stable conditions. There was snow here 
about a total of, of five days. It's out on the plains of Colorado. It kind of gets a dusting of snow. Okay, so basically using here, we have measurements of the snow surface within infrared sensor. We have measurements of the flux and we have measurements of the air temperature. And in, this, in the shallow cold pool site, we have so many measurements that we can trust them all, okay, as long as they agree. Okay, so what's happening? So here's the shallow cold pool site with the 10 meter measurements, which is your standard where you're supposed to be measuring things. And what you can see is here is the model representation of the sensible heat flux on the y-axis and the observed representation of the sensible heat flux on the x-axis and the dashed line is the one-to-one -one line these are the different stability schemes you could pick and then the um, shading is the number of events that fit in that box category the numbers shown here are the overall bias so the first thing you see is that cases with small overall biases in the sensible heat flux are actually caused by compensating errors. The Mononobokov scheme, which is not is kind of difficult to even call the Mononobokov scheme because remember it was just a linear function of the wind speed and the temperature gradient, um, had the smallest bias, but it didn't represent the actual shape or structure of the observations at all. Um, the Anderson scheme had the next smallest bias, um, but this was also due to um, offsets of some, um, the majority over predicting with some um, modeling zero when it actually was quite large. So how do our observations vary with the parts of that flux parameterization? So this is the, um, difference between the air temperature and the surface temperature here. And um, the um, red line shows the median of the observations. Again, here's our sensible flux, and then these are bins, the number of events that fit in each category. So you can see here that um, when we're very close to neutral conditions, um, the, the temperature gradient is too small to generate a large sensible heat flux. So your sensible heat flux here is pretty small. Again, when you get out here, you have a really strong temperature gradient. You have a small sensible heat flux due to small conductance, right? You have very stable conditions, so it's not likely to happen. However, in the middle, you should have a sweet spot where you actually get the observed largest sensible heat flux because you have a strong gradient between the air temperature and the surface temperature, and you haven't yet decoupled due to stability. So now, how well do the different models actually represent this sweet spot? Mm, not, not really. Um, the simulated... Um, Simulated sensible heat flux really lacks that peak in the middle relative to the difference between the air temperature and the surface temperature. The other thing that's very interesting to note is that within the observations, the sonic anemometers actually record counter gradient fluxes. That actually means that they record cases where the air temperature is warmer than the surface temperature and yet the air is actually being cooled from below. They, well, the air is actually being warm from below rather than cooled from below. It's going the opposite way of what you would expect instead of the air warming the snow, moving the other way. Um, and you can see these in the sonic anemometers. No model has that. If the air temperature is greater than the surface temperature, the model is always gonna put it in the direction that's down gradient. Um, we can look at it similarly as a function of the wind speed versus the sensible heat flux. And if you look at wind speed, there are actually three different regimes. And um, these have been described in a paper by Ji Lun Soon in 2012. And um, what she has noticed is, is there's a um, strong wind speed threshold where turbulence intensity from low to high increases with wind speed up to a point. And then once you get stronger wind speed, 
you suddenly increase at a much more rapid rate. Um, so you see this in our observations. You can see that above a wind speed about five meters per second, your turbulent intensity with wind suddenly jumps up at a higher rate. And um, you can approximate this with a logarithmic fitting and our observations match well with about where the kink in the curve is in her paper. So, so why is this? The idea is that in regime one, you have winds, but the eddies from the wind shear are too small to totally reach the surface. So you just don't have really effective wind generated mixing. And once your wind gets above a certain speed, then your wind shear is strong enough to generate really large eddies that mix heat much more effectively down to the surface. Okay, so what's what's happening in this area three here? They also just like, these look odd. Area three also looks very odd. And this is called the um, intermittent turbulence regime. And um, the idea here is that, so what you see, um, here is a picture of the tower at the shallow cold pool experiment or the SCP Skippy site. Um, and then you see W is vertical motions as a function of time at all of these different heights. And so you can actually see that there are um, waves up above that cause um, fluxes moving down that are not the same from top to bottom. And so you can actually have a lot of times in the atmospheric boundary layer, you will have waves at the top of the boundary layer and you can have heat and moisture propagating from above that propagates down to the land surface but isn't directly measurable by the wind speed near the surface or by the gradients near the surface. So this area is something we would not expect any of our land surface parameterizations to get. And the only way we would get there is to have a fully coupled atmospheric land surface boundary layer model, which at this point in time is very computationally intensive to run, um, not a trivial problem. So here's just a picture of this wave propagating down towards the surface with, you know, it's in between the realm of where you might have an atmospheric model and a land surface model. Okay, so um, here's our observations with our regimes one and two. And you can see that the, the Anderson scheme does a bit get that kink, um, as does the Lewis scheme, um, but the kinks at the wrong spot. The, um, the constant uh, buoyancy correction in Nobokov doesn't have any kink whatsoever. So um, the slope of regime two turbulence is currently not well represented in the models. And the transition between regimes one and two is not well captured. Also regime three is outside the land surface domain. And so while it's happening in the real world, we don't expect to model it. Um, Mona Nobokov was fixed in the models to um, shut down some instability issues and is not representing um, observed physics very well as implemented. Um, so remember the Anderson scheme was forced to decouple at a Richardson value of 0.2. The um, Lewis scheme um, was trying to solve for a differentiable solution that would help transition between stable and unstable conditions. And the MART scheme was trying to represent subgrid variability. Mona Nobokov was just tuned to stop the surface from unrealistically cooling. Um, now, finally, regime four, what are we measuring in terms of counter gradient fluxes? And are there something we should even comprehend trying to model? Or is that a case where you should throw your observations out. Um, we'll talk more about that in model evaluation. Um, the interesting thing is that approximately 30% of all stable observations actually fell within this counter gradient regime, um, even at NCAR site where they had so many 
sonic anemometers um, that you would not think you're missing things. Um, what is happening? Um, a, a negative um, sensible heat flux by the equation is simply not possible during stable conditions as parameterized. The only way to observe it or think about it is to actually contemplate heterogeneity in the temperature gradient. That where your tower is, you see one direction of the difference between the surface temperature and the air temperature. And somewhere nearby, you don't. So here is a picture of, um, this is a plane um, with a visual camera on it and some thermal IR cameras. It's a plane that's run by the Applied Physics Lab at the University of Washington. And here's a picture where it's looking at the surface temperature as it flies over an area. And you can see from looking down from a plane that the surface temperature varies drastically across short areas in places where we have snow and stable conditions. Um, here the plane flew over, this is uh, I-90, if you've ever been uh, to Washington, it's our interstate highway going across the mountains. Um, the ski resort is to the north here, and our measurement site is at the little red dot. And the brightness temperature measured um, measured by the plane, you can see that the freeway is really hot, and the trees are also warm, and that the snow is right at zero. And you have a lot of other surfaces around it that are actually, um, like, the roads are considerably warmer than the air temperature. So when you are looking at a point measurement of the air temperature and the surface temperature, definitely the air temperature should be warming that snow, but that there are other things where you could expect turbulent eddies to be going the other direction. Um, so here's labeling snow surfaces, tree canopies, roads. Um, here's the, the time of flight, you can see the, the snow surface is right at zero. It's a warm day in May, and the air temperature is 10 degrees warmer. And you can see that the, the fluxes actually are measured in both directions that we actually see due to the heterogeneity of the landscape, um, different surface fluxes. So, okay, they are weird. Um, how could this occur? Um, it could be that, you know, at the surface, there's still a downward heat flux, but from where you put your sonic anemometer, you're very locally measuring an upward heat flux within an unstable layer. Um, this could happen if you have um, warmer trees with wind blowing over the warmer trees is causing a um, upward heat flux here. And then behind the trees, you actually have a cooler heat flux near the surface. Um, so it's likely heterogeneity in the land surface temperature that drives these counter gradient fluxes. So just to summarize um, what Carl taught us about turbulence, um, turbulence schemes as implemented vary quite a bit from each other and are unable to present most regimes of turbulence. Um, biases in simulated turbulence can be large or they could be small but still have great compensating errors. Um, Coupling between land surface and atmospheric models is still open for a lot of work, and heterogeneity in surface temperature is large and is not in all current schemes. Um, if you want to play with this at all, um, Carl's TurbPy is in GitHub. It's all in Python. You could look at it. Um, you can also, if you're looking for ways to plot things about snow, um, he has a lot of Python plotting code you might want to look at in there and he said he was happy to share with everybody in the class. Um, so are there any questions? That was me talking a lot without asking you guys to even type anything in your chat box. So if you don't have a question, tell me you're still awake, something. <laughs> Excellent. I've got notices people are still alive. <laughs> and Cassie promised to laugh at my jokes. That's great. <laughs> All right. It, it, it probably was so much your head is 
spinning and you're not ready to ask a question at this point. But as you as you're looking at your homework, at your simulations, thinking about things, um, please do post things on the discussion board. I will keep monitoring all of this week. I will work on getting all of your um, all of your write ups on the paper graded by the end of this week. And um, I will talk to you about trees. I know a lot of people are interested in trees on Wednesday. All right, here. Does, does Suma use the methods that Carl tested? Yes. So right here, Suma uses the Anderson, Lewis, or Mart scheme. You can pick any one of them. Um, Carl's results, which suggest that the Anderson scheme is the best of the three, but that there are further work to make any and all of them better. Um, Suma does not have the weird um, Mononobokov fix that is present in a lot of land surface models. And so you can set the stability formulation to any of these three in your Suma run. Any other questions? All right, again, if they come up, I'll answer the discussion board. And thank you for your time. Uh, we have a sunny afternoon in Seattle, so I hope everyone's enjoying nice fall weather wherever you may be.